And I'd like to start by telling you about my first day, my first few minutes actually, at my first real job at a college. It was a Monday, drove to work about 8.30 a.m., parked the car, went into the building, crossed the lobby, and made my way into an elevator. Before the door closed, a gentleman walked in. I immediately recognized him. It was Rich Fairbank, the chairman and CEO of Capital One, the company I just started working at. As the two of us make our way up in that elevator, he turns to me and says, how are you, and what do you do here at Capital One? I was a little starstruck, but I think I managed to cobble something together around the analyst role that I had and the team that I was working on. <clears throat> and he smiled and said, that's a great team, and you do important work. But don't forget that at this company, your, my, and everyone's number one line job is to recruit, retain, and develop great talent. And those words have stuck with me. They ingrained the idea that talent acquisition and talent management is a collective responsibility, something that I'm sure resonates with all of you sitting here today, and why I hope what we're gonna talk about connects with each of you <clears throat> in some meaningful way. Now, that elevator ride with Rich that day changed my life forever. Within a few months, I was volunteering for entry-level recruiting events. Within a year, I'd taken over campus recruiting programs at several of our key schools, and within two years, I owned my department's nationwide analyst recruiting strategy. Now, my desire to help companies recruit, retain, and develop great talent followed me to business school, which is where I eventually met my co-founder, as well as Dr. Charles O'Reilly, one of, if not the leading authorities on organizational culture and behavior. Together, we built a software company that was focused on organizational culture measurement and analysis. Now this was, as Dave said, before the Tugboat Institute was formed, so we were not set up as an evergreen company, but we did work with many. We eventually sold that business, and I've stayed in and around the space for the last 10 years, and so today I wanted to share some of my learnings with you all, as well as some of Dr. O'Reilly's research. Over the next 20 minutes, I'd like to do three things. First, talk through and connect some of the macro workforce themes that all of our businesses are likely facing, not just this year, next year, but for many years to come, and the headwinds those are likely to create. Second, I'd like to propose culture as an often overlooked solution, or at least mitigating factor to some of these headwinds, and a real source of competitive advantage. And third, as you all are evergreen leaders, I'd encourage you to really lean in, because I believe that evergreen companies are uniquely positioned to actually harness this competitive advantage. All right, so let's get into it. Baby boomers are retiring in droves. Peak 65, or also called the silver tsunami, apparently, um, is upon us. <laughs> these, are, these are real terms. <clears throat> And so that means starting this year in 2024 and for the next several years, we are going to see the largest wave of retirees leaving the workforce. Now the problem is the younger generation entering the workforce isn't nearly as large and therefore can't fill the void. Rainer Strack, a partner at the Boston Consulting Group, actually gave a really powerful TED talk about this a few years back, which I encourage you all to go check out. I pulled one of the illustrations he uses in that TED talk to help bring this concept to life. And so he talks about the German economy and specifically the working age population that's driving growth within that economy. So what you see here is a 2014 snapshot of the population in Germany and the red shading is the working age population. That little picture up there is, is Rainer. He then proceeds to roll the time period forward up until 2030, showing how the workforce is going to evolve over that time period. Again, these are known numbers because the workforce of tomorrow is already born today. He then proceeds to compare the 2014 workforce to the 2030 workforce. And immediately, you can tell what the problem is. There just simply aren't the same number of humans to do the jobs in 2030 that there were in 2014. Now they ran this analysis not just for Germany, <clears throat> but across a number of different countries. And the conclusion BCG came to was that we are facing a persistent global workforce crisis. There just aren't enough humans. And this is creating a huge and widening gap between the number of jobs companies are hiring for and the number of workers available for them to hire. 
What you're looking at here, because it already shows up in the data, so this was easy to pull, is the blue line shows the number of job openings in the US over time, and the red line shows the number of unemployed folks in the US. Essentially, the supply of labor that's on the sidelines and able to take those jobs. And what you'll notice is in the late 20 teens, those lines crossed. And aside from the pandemic related disruption, really haven't crossed again, and frankly, given the workforce crisis we just talked about, are unlikely to cross again in the near future. So there are always going to be more jobs we're all looking to hire than there are people available to hire. Now this has a pretty substantial ripple effect. It's shifting the balance of power between the employee and employer dynamic in ways that are very tangible. Wage growth is going up. You're all seeing this in your businesses, I'm sure. Voluntary quit rates have been steadily rising for 15 years. And even though they've come down slightly off their peak due to some of the Fed tightening and, and some of the recent layoffs, they're still above where they were 20 years ago. And perhaps most surprising to me is that unions are cool again. Collective bargaining in action is actually starting to impact industries and companies we long thought were immune from it. And I don't know about you, but five years ago, I wouldn't have been thinking about this. So I was actually curious, and I went back and, and was looking at the data. Union participation rates had been steadily declining since the 1980s, and it actually more than halved, up until 2020. And that trend has recently reversed. 2022 and 2023 actually saw the highest election win rates for unions in 20 years. And the reason I, I, the chart I had showed 22, I plotted 23 there for you to show that I don't think this is a blip. I think this is the start of potentially a new trend. So what can we do about this? How do we continue to grow our businesses in the face of a global workforce crisis? Well, as you all know, there are two core inputs to growth. The amount of labor you have to do the jobs you need done and how productive that labor is. What you're looking at here is a CBO, Congressional Budget Office, projection of US GDP growth in the US. And what it clearly shows is the impact that a shrinking workforce will have on the US economy. Now, while the size of the global workforce is known and it's immutable for the next 20 years, what this doesn't fully take into account is the fact that borders are not hermetically sealed, companies are permeable, and most importantly, talent is fluid. So good leaders are probably looking at this and saying, how can I do more with less? I would argue great leaders are looking at this and saying, how can I do more with more? Specifically, in the face of a constrained labor environment, how do I capture an outsized share of the available labor pool to keep growing my company? The other thing the CBO does here is it holds the assumptions around productivity constant, an assumption I imagine many of you are challenging, I know I am, <clears throat> in our businesses today. How do we actually become more productive? I argue that culture is a solution to both of these, and I aim to show you some data here in a second that hopefully will support this point. Now, we can't talk about productivity improvements without talking about technology. And I don't think it's a coincidence that things like ChatGPT and artificial intelligence you know, are uh, as talked about today as they are because they are going to be real components of a solution to this, to this problem. But they also have a substantial impact on jobs. Another really interesting piece of analysis that the Boston Consulting Group did is this. They call it the Great Disruption Index. <clears throat> and so what they essentially did is they looked at the skills that employers were looking for when hiring for certain jobs five years in the past and compared the skills that those same employers say they're looking for today when hiring for those exact same jobs. And what you can see is that virtually all job functions are experiencing change, and that change is happening at a rate faster than ever. Now, some of this isn't surprising, right? You take a data engineer all the way on the left, that's evolving so quickly, there's a high degree of uh, um, change in the, in the skills that you're looking for. But what really surprises me is the more over to the right you go and you look at things like line cooks that have a 37% change in the type of skills you're looking for today it just tells you how technology is affecting all of the different job functions in our economy. So 
Why does this matter? Well, at the end of the day, if your labor pool is constrained, if the jobs you manage to hire people into today are changing and what you're hiring them to do for you today isn't going to be the same thing they're going to be doing for you in 10 years, you got to think differently. Jim Goodnight had this fantastic quote that I shared with you here um, where he says 95% of his assets drive out of the gates every night and it's his job to make sure they come back the next day. He understands that his people are essentially his real source of sustainable competitive advantage. So it comes down to culture. Now what is culture? I'll tell you what culture is not. Culture is not engagement. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with um, folks and after a while it becomes clear that as folks are talking about culture, what they actually are talking about is engagement. And the work they're doing internally is actually focused on engagement and not culture. So I thought I'd leave you with a really simple kind of framework here, which is culture drives engagement, which in turn drives performance. And as I said, most companies are focused on measuring engagement, but actually miss the idea of actually focusing earlier and measuring organizational culture. Admittedly, culture is a really confusing term, so much so that Mary Barr hates the word, right? When she talks about culture, what she means is how they all behave. Doug McMillan at Walmart agrees. When Walmart's talking about culture, what they're talking about is essentially behavior. So I thought I'd give you my definition of culture. Culture is the pattern of behavior that is reinforced by people and systems over time. Culture is the pattern of behavior that is reinforced by people and systems over time. It's a social control system, or as I like to think about it, it's what's left when you leave the room. When you're all sitting here, how are your teams thinking about and prioritizing decisions? What are the behaviors that they're promoting and what are the behaviors that they're avoiding? And like most social control systems, right, if you don't manage it or if you don't think about it, it can actually undermine your ability to execute your strategy. And as Peter Drucker famously said, right, if it can't be measured, it can't be managed, culture probably should be measured. And you can measure it, whether you use tools that are in market today, whether you build something homegrown. Now I'd argue the two most important things to think about when measuring and thinking about your culture are one, how strong is my culture? And what I mean by strength of culture is the alignment in people's understanding around the types of behaviors that drive our culture and that should be promoted. The stronger the culture, the more aligned everybody's understanding of that is. The weaker the culture, the more divergent folks' views around that are. The second is, what defines my culture? Right? How are we prioritizing these decisions? And so, apologize that it's small here, but what you see on the, on the bottom uh, half of the screen is actually analysis that was conducted at one of our clients a number of years ago where the, I think it's the green line is the executive team, the blue line is the customer service team, and the black line is the R&D department. And what you can essentially see is there's a high degree of alignment around a shared understanding of culture other than one important pillar, customer orientation. And so what this tells us is that when thinking about product roadmaps and how to think about prioritizing features and functionality, the R&D department isn't necessarily weighting the customer input as heavily as the organizational culture within that company would dictate that it should. Another really interesting analysis we did, we were called in to do a culture benchmarking study for uh, an organization that had just moved into new offices. They had two floors in a large office building and they had brought in a consultant to help them um, organize the employees across those two floors. Now what that consultant had recommended is that they put all of the senior leaders and, and executives on one floor and the employees on another with the idea, you know, this was well rooted, with the idea of creating cross-functional um, collaboration and communication. When we came in and did this benchmarking study, what we found was astounding. The decision to organize employees in this way was having a very substantial impact on organizational culture. As you can see here again, high degree of alignment around most of the cultural pillars <clears throat> underpinning this analysis, other than one important one, where the employees on one floor had widely divergent views than the executives on another. When they saw this, they went back, reorganized the employees, we did another measure six months later, and that gap had all but disappeared. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is 
intellectually interesting, but does it matter? Well, this is, I think, where Dr. O'Reilly's research comes in. And the short answer is it does. So what he's looked at across a number of different studies is how culture impacts real business outcomes. In this case, what he was looking at is cultural compatibility. So how does someone's cultural DNA within your company and the fit within that, uh, within that company ultimately translate to real performance and the amount of time that employee stays with your company? On the left-hand side, you know, what he would do is go into an organization, do a culture benchmarking uh, study, and then as they hired individuals, he'd measure them on day one, ask them to take a cultural assessment, score that, provide a compatibility score against the benchmark, and then sit back and receive outcome data. What performance ratings did that individual receive over time? Did they stay with the company? And what you can see is there's a pretty strong relationship between how compatible someone was with the organizational culture and their performance over time and the amount of time they ended up staying with that business. Now, we loved working with sales teams because sales teams have very tangible performance metrics. This was a piece of analysis that we did with a nationally distributed large sales uh, team where, we, again, we looked at the cultural compatibility of the sales reps coming in on day one and what their ultimate steady state sales performance was after ramp. And what we were able to show is that, on average, right, a 10% increase in cultural compatibility led to a 30% increase in sales potential. Now this can also be done at the corporate level. What you see here is, and these papers are, are dense, but for those who are interested, I encourage you to go, to, go, to go check it out. This is the outcome of some seminal work that Dr. O'Reilly did that was published in 2014, where he looked at strength of culture and the relationship between how strong culture was, and in particular in this case, it was adaptability-based cultures because these were publicly traded technology companies, and real performance outcomes. And as I said, these are public companies, so the data was, was widely available. And what he saw is, over a set period of time, those he, where he had gone in and measured a strong organizational culture, again, that means an aligned view around what that culture, uh, that, what those norms and behaviors should be, what he found is companies who had a strong culture outperformed companies with a weak culture when it came to revenues by a factor of four their stock price increased 21 times more than those who had a weak culture. And there actually is a slight tiny bar you can't see here, but a staggering 750 times more when it came to net income. Another really interesting piece of research that Dr. O'Reilly did, and one of the most encouraging ones, I think, for all of us, <clears throat> is this. So he looked at the percent, uh, the percent change in revenue growth amongst three groups of companies. Companies where there was no explicit effort whatsoever around measuring and managing organizational culture. Those who were making some attempt at it. And a third bucket where there was an explicit effort to improve organizational culture. And the takeaway is clear. Even beyond what it is you're doing, the idea of doing something is better than doing nothing and being intentional when it comes to organizational culture. So I find this really encouraging. All right, so how do we tie this back to evergreens? I mentioned that I believe evergreen companies are uniquely positioned to harness organizational culture as a competitive advantage. And I think it's because it's in the DNA, right? If you look back at the seven Ps, I've pulled three here, you're people first. This isn't just something that you say, this is actually something that you live. You're purpose-driven. This provides a strong beacon to attract folks looking for more than just a job, right? We're looking for how to differentiate in this constrained labor environment. And it's a North Star that provides a really solid foundation and an authentic foundation upon which to build a strong, tightly-knit organizational culture. And third, you've all made the commitment to paced growth as distinct from hyper-growth. I'll leave you with one final story here. This, is a, this was work we did for a large publicly traded company. And we were called in to do a, uh, a culture mapping analysis. And what we found was incredibly startling. At the highest levels of the organization, uh, this was a global organization, at the highest levels of the, of the organization, there was 
an incredibly strong cultural signal, highly aligned views around the norms and behaviors that govern the organizational culture. And then right when you got to the kind of senior manager director level and below, that strength score fell off a cliff. Widely divergent views around organizational culture. When we presented this analysis to the CEO, what he shared with us was that they had just gone through a period of hyper growth and had over a very short period of time hired more middle managers than they ever had in the company's history. And what happened is obvious in hindsight, right? Those middle managers didn't have time to integrate and assimilate the culture and were unable to cascade that down. I think as evergreen companies, you largely avoid those sorts of problems. All right, so as we look to wrap up here, if there's three things I'd like you to take away from this, it's these. First, there are some really strong talent headwinds facing all of our businesses today. And so what got us here isn't necessarily gonna get us there. And as we think differently, I'd encourage you all to really think about being intentional around organizational culture. It does drive tangible outcomes, and it's a precursor to things like engagement. So solve for it, measure it, track it, and continuously work on it. And third, I think you should feel great and privileged that as evergreen companies, you have a unique ability to harness this competitive advantage. And I think it will really help capture an outsized share of this shrinking labor pool and, incur and allow your employees to be more productive um, than just relying on technology alone. So I'll leave you with more powerful words than I could ever come up with myself. Um, Lou Gerstner, who's widely credited with turning IBM around in the late 90s, um, said it probably best when after his long and illustrious career, what he had finally figured out is culture is everything. Thank you. Thank you.